pain and all of that very graphically depicted. Your friend kind of looks at you and scratches their head and says, and, and so why do we call this Good Friday, right? It's kind of a perplexing thing. We take it for granted as Christians that we know why it's Good Friday, but many in the world have no idea why it is Good Friday. In fact, I thought about, I contemplated just briefly showing a clip from The Passion of the Christ here before this message. And after watching it, I sat in my office and watched a couple of clips from it and just began to cry. Just overcome at what our Lord endured for us. And I thought, well, that's probably maybe a little too intense, you know, uh, here at this place. And, you know, The cross will bring offense. The Bible says that. The preaching of the cross will bring offense. We don't have to be offensive. It will bring offense. And you'll see that in just a moment as we get into the Scripture. And, uh, but in this day of seeker-friendly services where churches have so tried to tailor things not to offend anybody, they've removed crosses from their building so that not to offend anybody, They've taken songs about the blood out of their songbooks because we don't want to offend anybody. And cross will bring offense. And uh, in fact, it always has. It's not just something new today. It always has. And uh, just ask Paul, the apostle. Because right from the very beginning, the cross was a divider among people. You can talk about a lot of things about spirituality with people, but you bring up the cross and you're going, to you're going to create a dividing line with people. They're going to go to one side or the other on that subject. But if you want to know what it was like for Paul to preach the gospel or why it is Good Friday, we can look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 24. We'll read this passage and we'll go back and look at it. Paul says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And our main thrust this morning is going to be those last two verses we read, verses 23 and 24. We preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. We see here, as Paul is talking about the cross, and the preaching of the cross, there are three reactions to the cross that he talks about here. First of all, he tells us that the preaching of the cross is a stumbling block to the religious. A stumbling block to the religious. There was no more religious uh, group in the world than the Jews. Their whole uh, way of life was built around the scriptures and about what God had given them, the commandments God had given them to live. And so everything in their life was a reflection of their religious belief. And so we might say that the Jews were really the religious crowd. And it was Christ crucified was to the Jews a stumbling block. You see, a Messiah that would die on a cross didn't fit into the typical Jewish theology. As they look back over their national history and you go back to the Old Testament, it just didn't make sense to them that this would be how the Messiah would come and what he would accomplish. Hanging on a tree, or a cross in this case, was evidence of being cursed of God. Their Messiah was the anointed of God, the blessed of God, and here they were preaching a Christ or a Messiah that had been crucified, which in their economy and their understanding of Scripture meant that he was cursed. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and through 23 says this, And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, 
and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that hanged is hanged is a curse of God, and that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. In their view and their understanding of Scripture, if anyone hung on a tree, they were cursed of God. And Jesus was cursed of God, but not for himself, for us. The Bible says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Jesus Christ was suffering the curse of God on himself on the cross. That's why he would cry out upon the cross and say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because in that time when he took upon your sins and my sins on the cross, God had to turn his back on his only begotten son because he, is a, he was too pure to look upon sin, so he turned from his own son hanging on the cross. And so the curse that Jesus bore was not his own curse, but ours. As the Jews, it says they were a stumbling block because the Jews look for a sign. As they look back through the Old Testament record of their history, they saw that every time God sent a deliverer to their nation, he was accompanied by some miraculous signs. There was some miraculous working of God in his life, and they saw the signs with him, and so they were looking for signs. Now, Jesus, of course, came with signs and miracles. You can't read through the Gospels and not read across all of the miracles that Jesus did. But they were not accepted by those who did not wish to believe. Now, here's the point. They did not want to believe, so therefore the miracles were not enough. Let me give you an example. Over in John chapter 6, we have the probably one of the most startling and most uh, overwhelming miracles that Jesus performed. He took two, uh, two fish and five loaves and fed 5,000 men. It's, the Bible says it was 5,000 men. In addition, there were also women and children. So we're probably looking at more like 15,000, 20,000 there at that place that he fed with that very meager supply, two fish and five loaves. And yet, as you continue to read in chapter 6, you read on down, Jesus calms a storm on the Sea of Galilee, passes over to the other side. And on the other side, the very next day, after the feeding of 5,000, he meets the same crowd over there. They want to make him a king. And Jesus asks them to believe in him as their king, to believe in them as, as the Messiah. And they said to him, listen to this, they said therefore unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? I mean... They probably still had breadcrumbs in the folds of their robe and the smell of fish on their breath from the meal the day before. And they said, what kind of miracle are you going to do to show us that you're the Messiah? And he just showed them one of the greatest miracles ever performed in feeding the 5,000. Amen? It tells me that there are some people that are always looking for something, but they really don't want to believe. You know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to see the power of God demonstrated in a person's life. I want to see that in my own life. I want to see what God does in my own life. Amen? You do too. But the problem exists when a man demands a miracle or a sign for the purpose of evaluating Jesus. Let me test you, Jesus. Let me evaluate you and see if you're worthy of my trust. That, put, that attitude puts man in the superior position and reduces God to nothing more than a genie who grants wishes on demand. There are, of course, many people today who are waiting for some supernatural manifestation from God, they say, before they will believe. You know, I will believe if God heals my child. I will believe in him if he fixes my marriage. I will believe if I get a job, if I get out of this foxhole alive. And on and on it goes. And we, no matter what, God does or performs, people want to see more. Kind of like Lay's potato chips. One is not enough. You know, you can't just settle for one. You got to keep going on and on, more and more. So they were demanding a sign, and it was a, it was a stumbling block, or literally it was scandalous. The word stumbling block is the word scandalon, 
which we get the term scandalous from. A, a scandal on was an impediment or that or a obstacle that caused someone to trip or blocks their way. So the preaching of the cross was something that they tripped over. They were after all they were after all God's chosen people. They weren't pagans. Why did they need a cross? Why did they need someone dying for them? I mean, we're we're the ones God looks down on. He's favored us. We're not like those other pagans, those Romans and other Greeks and Gentiles. We're not like them. We're God's chosen people. You know, modern Americans often become offended when confronted with their need for salvation. People get offended when you tell them they're a sinner. I was an associate pastor in Michigan for a number of years, and, and on one occasion I made a visit on a family there that had come to our church, and their child had gone down into our Sunday school area. And when I went over to make the visit on this family that visited with us, the mother was absolutely livid. She was angry, and she really poured it out. She just told me that she couldn't believe it, that down in the Sunday school department, somebody told her little boy he was a sinner. And, and I, I, I assured her, I said, ma'am, that's because your son is a sinner. In fact, I want to tell you, you're a sinner too. I was not a real popular visitor that day in that home. You know, in, in the Jewish opinion was they needed a Messiah to deliver them from Rome, not from themselves, not from something they had done, but what Rome was doing to them. They needed a savior from Rome. You know, it's funny, but you, you watch the news. I guarantee you, you watch the news, whether you watch it last night, you watch it tonight, you watch it all week long, and I will guarantee you, you'll hear about murders, you'll hear about war, you'll hear about rape, you'll hear about domestic violence, you'll hear about child abduction, you'll hear about robberies, but never once will one of those newscasters ever mention sin. That would be offensive to their viewers, right? I've never turned on the news and said, a sinner held up a convenience store today. <laughs> Though that is really the truth, amen? People want God to, they'll say, yes, we need a savior, but what people want is not a savior from their sins, they want a savior from their circumstances. They want God to save them from disease, from COVID. They want to be saved from inflation. They want to be saved from that other political party. You know which one that is, that's the one you don't belong to, it's the other one, right? <laughs> they want to be saved from that, but not from sin. You know, we, we see our need as being saved from our circumstances, not from our sin. But God knows that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory or the perfection of God. Man is a sinner and he needs a savior. So the preaching of the cross is a stumbling block to the religious, to those people who feel like they've got their own self-righteousness. They're okay. They don't need to be saved from sin. So it offends them, and it becomes a stumbling block. But then you go on, and it's a laughing stock to the respectable. Unto the Jews is a stumbling block. Unto the Greeks, it is foolishness. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. You know, Greek society represented education, art, everything that was culture. The big, the big things for the Greek culture was the Colosseums, where the sports went on. It was the theater, where the plays were presented. All of those things, the artwork that they produced, if, if you were sophisticated, you had a Greek view of life. You know, I was just reading the other day, and I, I was amazed by this uh, article the other day, that on one of the major university campuses, there was a cross. Probably been there much longer than the political correctness crowd's been around, but it, there was this cross on a major un university campus, and it was defaced by some students. They hung a sign on it that had the letters spray painted F-O-F-L, which if you know, you know internet shorthand stands for fall on the floor laughing. They thought the, that the cross was a joke and they put that sign on the cross to demonstrate that. I thought that was rather ironic given that Many 
fraternities on major campuses adopt Greek names. It's called living the Greek life uh, there on those campuses. So I guess you could still say that the cross is still foolishness to the Greeks, to those who are the elitist, to those who are the cultured. Nothing could seem more illogical than believing that an obscure son of a carpenter could live and die in an obscure part of the world and provide salvation to the entire population of the world if they would just believe on him. That just sounds foolish. Today, men consider the idea that God would be so narrow-minded and exclusive as to offer only one way into heaven is ludicrous and scoff at anyone who believes that Jesus is the only way to a personal relationship with God. That's too narrow-minded. You're too backward. You know, I, I love the argument that I heard somebody say one time that, you know, they say that we are being exclusive because we say Jesus is the only way. But you understand that Christianity is not exclusive. It is very inclusive. It's the most inclusive of any religion because Jesus makes his promise. He said, whosoever shall believe. Amen? It's for whosoever. The door is wide open, but you have to come by way of the cross. You have to come by Jesus Christ. Preaching the cross is a stumbling block to the religious. It is a laughing stock to respectable, but it is a solid rock to those who are redeemed. For you and I who believe, it is God's way of salvation. But unto them which are called, that is, the Holy Spirit has reached, has spoken to your heart and called you out. It's convicted of your sins. You've received Jesus Christ, both Jews and Greek. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The cross demonstrates for us who have believed God's transforming power. God's transforming power. First of all, in salvation. As we look back to the first verse we read this morning in 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Paul uses the same word there in power of God that he does in his letter to the Romans, chapter 1, verse number four, uh, 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is the power, the dynamis, the dynamite of God. It is the greatest power the world has ever seen unleashed, and it was unleashed on the cross. Man tries to become wise through rationalization, trying to understand things and trying to figure it out in his own mind. But God discloses his wisdom through revelation. Man uses rationalization. God gives it through revelation, something we could never discover on our own. If you look at verse 21 for just a moment, let me show you in that verse. It says, for after that, in the wisdom of God, this is God's holy, omnipotent, omniscient wisdom, the world by wisdom, by man's wisdom, knew not God. You see, it's always been God's plan. It was God's plan that this would be so far beyond man, he could never figure it out himself. It was the wisdom of God that man in his wisdom couldn't find God. Are you following? It was God's wisdom. Some people say, well, you know, if God, God wants us to know him and have a relationship, with him, why didn't he make it easier for us? Why didn't God make it so much easier? Well, it was part of God's plan to make it so hard that man on his own could not figure it out. He would, in fact, have to come to the end of himself and just trust what God has said. So it is the wisdom of God that man couldn't find him in his own wisdom. And so he had to come to God through the revelation of God. God saves only those who believe Men can't figure out salvation. They can only accept it by faith. The most well-known verse of Scripture in all the Bible says that God so loved the world that what? He gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I love that verse First of all, because it expresses God's love for us. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. So 
you'd say, well, is the whole world saved? No, it's whosoever, that whosoever believeth in him. Not just believeth him, but believeth in him. You see, I can believe somebody and not believe in them. Brother Bill Hebel, I pick on you a lot, Bill, don't I? Aren't you glad you came today? I'll pick on you again. All right. I can believe Bill. Bill can come in and tell me something, say it's raining outside. I can believe Bill. Okay. I can believe what he's talking about. But that doesn't at the same time mean I believe in Bill. Now, I do believe in Bill. Bill's a great guy. I could give Bill a $100 bill and expect at least $75 back. But I, no. I believe if I trusted him with that, he would give it back to me. I could believe in him to do what he says he's going to do. Bill is a man of his word, and I could believe in him. You know, when we believe in Christ, we're not just believing what Christ taught. We're believing in him. We're having total confidence that he can do what he says he will do. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can believe in him. Not just believe him, but believe in him. And so God brought man to the end of himself. Man could never figure this thing out. In fact, you see men still trying to figure out how to fix all their problems. You know, we, we hear it on the news. We, we look around us. We see people trying to figure out how to get out of the mess we're in. And yet they, they can have all of their conferences together, all their summits, and they can't find a solution because man can't come to it with rationalization. They can't come to the answer in their own wisdom. They have to turn to God and just believe in what God has told us. And we believe in him. Not only does God, through the cross, use this transforming power in salvation. Now, if you think that's all the cross is, is God's way to get us into heaven, you've missed out on a greater part of the blessing. You see, because God's power, transforming power, is also available in our sanctification, and it uses the cross. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, verse 18 says, us which are saved, and that word saved is in the present tense. It means it's they're being saved in the power of God. You see, the work of salvation is both the miracle of a moment and it is also the ongoing sustaining work, the result of the ongoing sustaining work of Christ in my life. I can't save myself and I cannot keep myself saved. Having begun in faith, I'm not now made perfect in the flesh. I can't do it myself. I can't work it out. I have to trust him all the way through. You see, this may confuse you, but I'll show you a verse here in a minute. I think that'll, that'll explain it completely. There's three tenses to salvation. I have been saved from the penalty of sin. I am being saved from the power of sin. And one day I will be saved from the very presence of sin. You say, well, that's fancy words, but do you have scripture to prove that? Well, if you will look in your Bibles over one more book to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 10. And Paul is speaking to the Corinthians again about the power of God in their life. In first, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, Who, that is Christ, delivered us from so great a death, that was when we trusted him as our personal savior. He saved us from the penalty of sin. I don't have to worry about the second death. I don't have to worry about going to hell. He has saved me from so great a death and doth deliver. Right now, today, he is delivering me over the power of sin in my life that is at work still in my life. And he's saving me now through his power in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. In the future, he's going to take us out of the very presence of sin. One of these days, sin is not going to be a problem. Amen? Hallelujah. One day, it won't be any temptations around us. We'll be in a perfect environment and saved from the very presence of sin. Today, the cross is at work in my life as a believer as I appropriate its power over the principles of sin that war in my members. There is a war going on inside me. 
Paul even talked about that. He says, the things that I would do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, those are the things I end up doing. And he said, it's that, that war, that power, that old man within me that's still at war. So where does the victory come? Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. There's the cross again. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then he goes on in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, and said, But God forbid that I should glory, that I should brag, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have anything to brag about Steve Parks. I can't stand up here and tell you what a wonderful guy I am. Now, I am so wonderful. Don't talk to my wife, but I am so wonderful, you know. I can't glory in anything that I've done, but I can only glory in the cross. Why? By whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. I have to die daily. That cross is still something that works in my life. And so the cross of Christ both provides the power of God in salvation and in my sanctification as I want to live for him now. See, God put a new want to in my life. Did he do that in your life? You know, I, I have a new want to. I want to live for him. Somebody said, you know, now that, now that I'm saved, I drink all I want to, I swear all I want to, I, I do all the dirty things I want to. Only thing is, is God's changed all my want to's. I have a new want to in my life. But to do that which is right, I find not in myself. I have to die to self, and I have to let Christ live in me. Let Christ live his life through me so that others can see him. So there's the sanctification. Not only do we see God's transforming power when we receive him, but we see God's transcendent wisdom. We've talked a little bit about this. It says, and the wisdom of God in verse 24. You know, and when we look at the cross, we see that this wisdom of God is so unique. There's a profound wisdom in God's unfolding plan of redemption. And the cross is central to that. And it defies human logic. It doesn't really make sense. From the very beginning, when God created the world and he gave man a restriction, he said, Thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the garden. And man listened to the temptation of the devil, and he sinned and fell. You know, God could have at that moment decided, that's it for mankind. I'll just wipe them out and start all over again. But God decided instead to take man's failure and turn it into his greatest triumph as he showed over the course of human history how God has worked to bring about this great plan of redemption. It defies human reasoning that God could turn Satan's triumph into his greatest failure. And we see that God turned the darkest deed of humanity on the cross to the ultimate demonstration of his love. At the cross, man did his worst and God did his best. Paul told the believers in Ephesus that though that through the revelation of his plan to the redeem mankind to redeem mankind God did all of this it says over in Ephesians so that the principalities and powers that is various ranks and hosts of heavenly beings in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God when God did this great work through the cross, all of those heavenly hosts could just stand back in awe and just say, man, look what God has done. Look what he's worked out, how he's taken this murder of his only begotten son and turned it into the salvation of mankind to his honor and glory. And it came for the honor and glory of God. The message of the cross is unique. Only God could have come up with this kind of message. Only the wisdom of God could have planned this. The message of the cross is universal. I want to tell you, the cross is not the Protestant way to be saved. It's not the evan evangelical way to be saved. It's not even just the Baptist way to be saved. It's the only way to be saved. The only way. 
The only road that leads to eternal life goes by way of Calvary. There's no other way but this. If I err gains, gain sight of the gates of light, it'll be by the way of the cross. My pastor used to tell a story about a Victorian London about a little boy, a, a Bobby there in, in uh, London came across this little boy. It was getting dark. They had turned on the street lamps and the little boy was crying. He was sitting on a corner and the Bobby knelt down and he started talking to the little boy and he found out the little boy was lost. He'd started out the day and started playing with his friends and walking and finally at the end of the day he looked up and he did not know where he was. And so the Bobby says, well, son, what's your address? Where do you live? And he says, I don't know. The little boy didn't know his address. So with quick thinking, the Bobby began to go through some of the, the different uh, landmarks there in London. He mentioned Big Ben, the Tower Bridge, the, bridge, the, the London Bridge. He began to mention these, Piccadilly Circus. Then finally, he mentioned Charing Cross. And the little boy's face lit up. He says, yes, sir, if you get me to the cross, I can get home. And you know what? That's the way it is for us. If you get us to the cross, we can get home. It's the only way to get home. The message of cross is universal. The message of the cross is unchanging. The Apostle Paul never changed his message. You read through the book of Acts, you'll find that whether he stood in a synagogue before a traditional Jewish congregation or on Mars Hill in Athens confronting Greek intellectuals, he was still preaching the cross. He said, stubbornly insisted, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. To one it's a stumbling block, to the other it's a laughing stock. But for us who believe, it's the solid rock. Amen. A couple of months ago, in my devotional reading, I came across a thought that said, among all the major religions in the world, only in Christianity do you find the central event of our faith to be the humiliation of our God. Think about that for a moment. That's... That's a profound thought. It just grabbed me by the collar that morning. Among all the major belief systems in the world, only in Christianity do you find the central event of our faith to be the humiliation of our God. The creator of everything that exists, thrice holy, all-powerful, come down in the flesh, mocked and misused, stripped naked and hung in open display before a jeering mob. That's exactly what happened on Good Friday those hundreds of years ago. Scripture says it this way, Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross." Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, giving him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yes, it truly is and was Good Friday. It's Good Friday not for what men did to our Lord, but for what our Lord did for men on the cross. Do you know him this morning as your solid rock? Or are you still stumbling along on the road to eternity? If you're hearing about the cross, if hearing about the cross this morning offends you, I am not sorry. For I would rather offend you with the truth than pacify you with a lie. And if the message of the cross is a joke to you, then I'm sorry for you. Because in the end, Psalm 2 tells us that he that sitteth in the heavens will laugh. And of course, we all know that he who laughs last, laughs best, right? The world scoffs and laughs at the things of Christ, but the day is coming when God will have the last laugh. He that sitteth in the heavens will laugh. Don't laugh your way into an eternal hell. 
realize that he is the solid rock. The transforming power of God is found at the cross and also the transcendent wisdom of God. And if you want to get there and you want to have a good journey, you go by way of the cross. And God will provide that for us. Bow your heads in a word of prayer this morning.